Hello, everyone. Whoops, I'm trying to trip all the wires. Uh, thank you all for coming and on this chilly day. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce our speaker tonight, Caroline uh, Lauren Bocage. And Caroline has been active as a choreographer, performer, and teacher for the past 20 years. She graduated from the School of Toronto Dance Theatre and has been teaching contemporary dance technique at Concordia University since 2005. She is the founder of L'Organisme and has served as the company's artistic director since its inception. Caroline was also a participant in the first iteration of our transdisciplinary convergence course, which is offered at Concordia University where she and her team produced a stunning video installation that fused art and neuroscience. Caroline is an exceptional dancer and she has danced for renowned choreographers such as Jeanette Lorat from Au Vertigo, Jacques Poulain-Denis, Paul-André Fortier, and Jean-Pierre Perron. She has also created several dance pieces which she presented at festivals such as Amour de la Danse and Festival Transamérique in Montreal. And she presented her work at venues in France, Hungary, Germany, and South Korea. Uh, her outdoor performance, Abiti Sa Mémoire, has been presented in more than 15 different cities in Canada, Europe, and Asia. Caroline is fascinated by the human body, which she places at the center of her choreographic research. She questions the biomechanical and neurological mechanisms that govern us and seeks to reveal details that appear invisible, the blind spots that inhabit us. Through live performance and installation, she attempts to reveal the thin, transparent thread that connects us to life and to our fellow human beings. For today's talk, Looking Inside to Unfold, she will share insights into her creative process and how she bridges scientific and artistic research. Please help me to welcome Kelly Lohan. Thank you everybody for the long talk. Huh? So uh, I'll start with a little history so uh, I can put you a little bit in, uh, in sync with uh, the art war, the art process, and uh, my own personal history. Uh, so we'll start. I got why I got into into neuroscience first. Uh, actually, 10 years ago, I had a little bit of an accident, you can say like this. Uh, I had a little part in my brain that uh, started bleeding. It discovered that I had an onchion on my optical bone So it means that it's not my eyes that have a problem. It's like when the reception of uh, the image goes through my brain, and there's a little bump, so it's, creates, it's creating a curve now, and I've lost part of my vision. So, this means that when you look at this picture, when I look at that picture, the yellow spot that you're seeing, I don't see it. So maybe it's why I got interested in the blind spot. <laughs> and um, it's, why, it's why I got interested also into, oh my God, like, how does the brain work? Because as a dancer, uh, I was fairly intrigued. Oh, I'm on. <laughs> fairly intrigued about uh, my body. So, uh, dancer, we practice, uh, you know, to understand all the biomechanics of the body. So, the flesh, the muscle, we want to understand our alignment, uh, which muscle work when uh, to release our weight. But then when something happens to your brain, you realize, oh my God, I have so much input through my brain and so much access to control my movement or control anything I want to have to happen into my work and to the world. So that experience completely changed my perspective and my way at looking at dance, movement, and process. Um, and I realized that uh, I was on the border of getting a surgery, and when it happened, I realized that it's probably the more intimate place in my body without knowing it, because it's the place where I could feel 
uh, could change the essence of what I was or who I am or how I perceive myself. I was like, oh my God, if I get a knee surgery, I'm not scared that I'm going to wake up and I'm going to see the world differently. But if I have a brain surgery, I felt like, oh my God, I can wake up and completely see the world differently. So it felt like suddenly I had a much more intimate relationship to my brain than I could ever expect. And I was, as a dancer, I never thought about this part of my body being so much involved in what I was doing. So then I started, this was kind of like a big landscape opening in front of me, and it was like, how this works. So my first input was to go into more uh, visual aspects of the brain. So I started looking at like uh, images of the brain. Uh, so anything that was relating to design, to images, so all the nice pictures that you can see on the wall when you we walk in, uh, neurons. Uh, so it was my first entry into the world of neurology. I started digging and using those images into my creative process. And then I created the piece called White Matter, where I put two dancers with helmet and uh, Unit, unit heart, and they had like fingers on top of their head, and all the motion was happening on the ground, and I was very inspired by all those uh, color and wires that you could see through uh, imagery. But then I was like, okay, this is great, but it just felt like the surface of things. And then I had the uh, great opportunity to get into the convergence class. So meeting with the scientists completely changed uh, my access to neurology because suddenly I could have access to the actual human being doing the research and having questions and seeing how they were having a process during neurology. And it was relating exactly with me having a process as a researcher and an artist and a creator. So that opened up a real uh, source of inspiration, but also it opened up ways to get more in touch with neurology. So as much as like resources of books and reading, and uh, but also having conversation with those uh, researchers. And one thing that I found uh, that was very inspiring is uh, in the research, I felt like both sides we were working with the gray lines. Like in dance, there's no text. There's no score uh, written when we're doing choreography or when we're creating. And um, in research, you're starting from a point that you're kind of trying to pull out like what's in between. You know a point, you know another point, but you're trying to make sense or to find the new thing between those two points. So I felt like we were sharing this bridge of uh, trying to get new information and unfold new information. So for me, this was a real turning point into the way um, I could relate research, scientist research, and artistic research. Because as dancers and as creators, we spend a lot of time either in the studio or looking at images or researching, and the scientist is also taking, is spending a lot of time in their labs that looking at images and, and also finding um, very specific answers to questions. So I felt that we were sharing that same, uh, that same preoccupation where finding a specific answer into like art relating and science relating, uh, we could share that. So from that experience, uh, I started digging into even more uh, into neuroscience and into my work and seeing how I could kind of like go back and forward uh, using research and bringing it in the studio. Uh, in convergence class, I did a uh, video, but at the same time, I wanted to bring uh, that knowledge of neurology into the dance studio and into my process. So today I'm gonna talk to you about the actual process um, that I, the last piece I created called Ground, which, um, and I'm gonna explain to you all the resources and references I took from neuroscience to inform my dance piece. So, so you have a kind of an idea of what I'm talking about. I'm just gonna show you an excerpt of the piece. So now we're gonna have the same kind of like 
knowledge about what I'm talking about when I'm going to go through step by step of how I created that piece. So. Okay. Like, what does it mean? What could it create? 
So from this idea of like working from that theory, like when I sit and I receive this theory, how do I feel? What does it make me confront or not? Uh, what kind of emotional charge does it have when I put my dancers like in a row all beside each other? So I generated and created a lot of material relating on bouncing. So we had a like a month of exploration uh, where I guided the dancer to ask them to uh, I don't know bounce from their foot to their other shoulder. So like like doing that. But then we can do this in different direction in space relating to someone or not. And then after that, I was like, okay, what does it do if we put it in a line? So. This is cute images that kind of like show you that process. So this first image on the top is like them just working on bouncing with each other. So often when you ask people to do a certain task, they're gonna relate to each other. They don't wanna do things away from each other. If you're experiencing something in your body, you wanna to relate to someone. So they were always uh, happening to do that task in a circle or close towards themselves. And then after that, we started trying to open the form. And then I was like, okay, what does it do if I put them in a line? And then we started working in that line and it was just very interesting what it was creating in relationship to each other because it was really hard for them to not look at each other. They were just wanting to have that connection or that acknowledgement of like, I'm doing this, am I right or not? So having to stay in their own position for me, it was also a way to relate to what we experience into circuit and rhythm that is, we're all having this, this cycle and this rhythm that is relating to ourselves. And that we all share that, but we don't need a relationship to share that because it's just happening. So it was a way to just uh, reinforce the circuit and the rhythm and our little trampoline is like, it could be your own house or your own brain, your own being, we still relate to each other, we're still on the same pathway, but we're not necessarily into each other's brain. So, so that's why uh, it kind of makes sense that they each have their own spot and they were not sharing a big, huge trampoline. This was a, a choice that was made. And then after that, I was like, oh, I really like the lines. And that, um, in that book, they, uh, they quote a few painters, and then I got really into Louis Morris's work with all the lines going up and down and to the side, and the colors, and I was just craving to have colors, because for me, it kind of like brings some kind of electricity or clarity uh, in the visual. So we got those orange pants. <laughs> And then I was like, oh, this feels right. But then we started working on different ways of putting the space. So here you can see a few uh, maquettes of the scenography. So we tried like different colors, different ways of putting the space uh, and this idea of lining up, like use of lines and use of lines. So with the orange colors and then with green colors and so, we had a few experiments, and finally, the light could do a lot of colors. <laughs> so we reduced that to minimal. And this was the set. I don't know if you can see it. I'm gonna print it out. Is there? Yeah. Here, I don't know if you see, but there's a gray line. It's very, very mild. Yes, it's really hard to see. But there's a gray line, and the choice of the gray line is that whenever the the dancer are jumping, then we can kind of see that there's a difference between when they're standing and then when they go up, then we can feel that there's a difference in perspective. So we're kind of playing with the idea of perspective. So we ended up having like two white panels and that the lights were doing the shift of color instead of being the whole scenography. This was in the process to kind of took out the layers of the colors. We left the colors in the pants and we played with uh, lights. Why did I want to play with lights? It's because the bouncing feeling 
really gets your uh, parasympathetic system going, so you could all fall asleep watching the dance beat. <laughs> so we needed something to go in contrast with the bouncing feeling. So the light is kind of like waking up your nervous system. So that's why we did very uh, fast trigger of lights where we can have a sense of time very differently and that also triggering your nervous system to be like, okay, wake up. And this light idea came from my son who's always playing Fortnite. <laughs> uh, and then I was, he was like, come and watch, come and watch. And I was like, I can't watch this. Like, this is like way too disturbing. There's like too many colors flashing at the same time. Like, I'm nauseous. But then I realized like, oh my God, there's like half of the, like so many people of the population that have that in their brain daily. So I thought, oh, I need to bring that reality into the artwork. So it was kind of like my plan to do a video game. Then the other book that was uh, a very big inspiration was the circuit in the oh, sorry, was that Your Brain is a Time Machine from Dave Boyle Manuel. And uh, it's, it's really uh, digging into circuit in the rhythm and the notion of time. So uh, how do we process time? How do we feel time? Uh, and how our circuit and rhythm is uh, relating in time. Uh, our circuit and rhythm, the period of the circuit and clock isn't exactly 24 hours, but naturally the cycle with a period closer to 23.5 hours. So it's close to the 24 hours. And they talk about people who don't have a stable also circuit and rhythm, and they can always feel like they're kind of out of track wake up late, um, if you have a hard time to wake up in the morning, then maybe your circadian rhythm is uh, a little bit off and it's why you're always dragging yourself. But then I was like, okay, 23.5 hours is off by 2%. What is this 2% off mean into creation? So I started working on this like synchronicity of movement. So wanting them to have the same rhythm, the same movement, so they can get into the same cycle. But when I create, I never show the movement. I always direct. So I'm going to say, like, you saw a lot of arm movement. So I'm going to say, now you're going to take eight counts to bring your hands together. Now you're going to take 12 counts to open your arms. Now you're going to take 16 counts to reach forward. And they do it, but they don't look at each other. So for me, it's my 2% of off is the way you do it. Because they all have their own way of interpreting, of doing the interpretation of what I'm asking to do. So it took them a long time. They were very frustrated because they weren't looking at each other. They were on a trampoline on a small surface. And then they were doing counts and doing those gestures. But then when they got out of that line and they watched, they were like, oh my God, we're all doing the same thing, but we're so different at the same time. Because even if we're working on a very similar pattern, your essence still stay who you are, the way you cross your hands. It's pretty much everybody has their own way of crossing their hands or reaching out or nodding or jumping. But it's all being done on the same cycle, on a, the same rhythm. So what I asked, what I created for them, it was kind of a chorus, like I created a musical partition for them. But then in their own body, they could play that partition in their own color, I would say. I can describe this this way. So my true percent was like, okay, can I create perfect synchronicity? And which part do I let go of? So I decided to let go of the part where they were doing it the way they felt like doing it. So they had to do the task, they had to do, go on the same count, but they could do it on their own manner. So that's why you can see each personality coming out of the work while you watch the work. So basically you see, you can see kind of a then landscape, but at the same time you can go and look at individually, everybody have their own story basically. And then 
another quote that was very inspirational for me was, uh, time as kept by the circadian clock isn't only limited to tracking the hours of the day, but it's also hidden from conscious access. So can I create a dance pattern that becomes automatic for the performance and second nature? So we, we work on those patterns so much that I was hoping that it could be kind of like an automatic in their body. feeding. So it could be automatic in, in their body. So you can see here that you know, this is the kind of movement I was looking for where they have their hands all together. And you know, like some, like one of them have their shoulder up and the other one, this is, I'm just doing a point from the other, um, the other quote, but they all have a way to uh, engage into the movement. So we work on this very strict pattern so they could, they could uh, express another layer and feel something else than just counting the whole time. So we rehearse very much so we can get like second nature for them to be on the trampoline and to jump together also. Then any physical phenomenon that can be repeated in a practical manner can be used to tell time. So if we use the example of throwing a rock on the water it's a, and then you have the ripple on the water it's a way to tell time. Like we throw something and then we see if, if there's no more ripple, so it means that the rock is down. And if there, you can see two ripples, then it just happened. So gravity is telling us time also. So that's why jumping on the trampoline is a way to tell time. How can I make that visible? Can we feel that together, the audience and the performers? So its relation to gravity can be used to feel, to process the notion of time. But I was asking myself when I was digging into circuit and rhythm. Then um, for the part of circuit and rhythm, uh, I would say that I use circuit and rhythm to do the dramaturgy of my piece. So I didn't use the idea of uh, neurology to create movement or create vocabulary for the piece. I use that to structure my piece, to give it like a beginning, a middle, and an end, to uh, guide me into how I would uh, process every part of the story, basically. So I use those elements to make decisions of how many times they would repeat a certain movement, uh, when did we need a break? Uh, when do the lights need to come in? Uh, how can we go forward? When do we need to break a pattern? So for me, it felt like another way to um, look at dramaturgy. Instead of looking at dramaturgy from like maybe an, emotion, an emotional place or a physical place, I look at dramaturgy using those uh, indications from neuroscience and from those studies to see like, oh, do what I put out there in terms of trials, how do I feel after in the reception of my work? Does it work or are I completely out of track? So it was kind of always a ping pong battle between me, my readings, and what I was experiencing and also what we were experiencing as a team in the creation. And then the part that I found the most interesting and that was the most revealing for me <laughs> was what it brought us together bringing this kind of information into the process. We each have our beliefs and um, just gonna read that quote and I'm gonna talk to you about it. So for millionaires it was taught that the daily fluctuation in sleep and activity of humans and other animals was governed by external cues most importantly, sunrise and sunset. I will say that in my team, everybody still believes that. Uh, so when I brought in that, we actually uh, had a circuit and a rhythm that was installed inside us and that we weren't going, uh, our rhythms wasn't being cued by the sunset and the sunrise. Nobody believed me. <laughs> it's kind of like I was like talking Chinese 
and uh, other language for them. And, and then it brought up a, a lot of um, discussion about what we believe and what's actually happening in front of us. I was like, guys, I don't want to like bring something out that is too much, but this is what I read and this is what I'm interested in digging into. So I thought it was very interesting to bring another perspective because in dance often we start from feelings and from, um, and it's great that we have another sense of uh, recep reception of the stimulus. Yes, we're often in emotion, sensation, uh, matter, the way we, we, we experience all the stimulus. But then when we arrive with uh, some scientific knowledge, it's interesting to just like see the clash of value and um, yeah, preconception of the world. And for me, it was super important that we have those, we could share those same territories because we are building an imaginary together. So if we don't start from sharing the same territories, the same basis, then we keep, we're not going to go into the work the same way. So by sharing those different ideas, that we got into great conversation, and then we could find another way to imagine what we were working on, to imagine the world, to imagine how we relate to the world, to, uh, and then everybody started um, reflecting on that and then bringing that into the process and being even more willing to uh, do what I was asking them that was really hard is to do a dance piece without really looking at each other and then being kind of like super open and um, vulnerable for the, to the audience and to themselves. So if I go more, it took more than two centuries for scientists to understand that all plants and animals have their own personal clocks and that even individual cells could oscillate with a 24 hour period. So knowing that, it was like, okay, how do we own that, that we have our own cycle, but on my cycle is relating to the person beside me, is relating to the world. And those stimulus can have an effect on my cycle, but I do possess a cycle and I'm just not being uh, manipulated by sunset and sunrise. So the other thing is when I told them that we actually had a place in our brain that the clock was, then this was also a part where they couldn't believe that. They were like, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, so I thought it was interesting to uh, bring that in and that, that um, yeah, the way we can visualize ourselves has an effect on how we're going to perform and how we're going to bring information. So all the information that we can bring that actually is available to us is going to be perceived even if it's like poetic and even as if it's like going through your animation, your imagination when you're performing something but you know that you're owning a certain part, it's like owning yourself even more while you're performing. So that's about it. Um, for uh, my whole process. Um, I'm still more and more interested into uh, digging with that information um, and to keep uh, the research going. I think that uh, the circadian rhythm and the cycle uh, brought an aspect of human uh, relation, human values that I was not expecting in my process. And I think this is the richness of uh, bridging neuroscience and art, is that it's just keeping ourselves to open up to new ideas or other ideas that we haven't thought of or we haven't seen. And I think the relationship between science and art can create that. Like, my aim is to create a new door into yourself to look at the world differently. And I think science can same thing into my work. So opening a new door to see the world differently and I can process that and kind of like do the ping pong game with the science and the art.
is we are feeding each other to just open up our consciousness of the world and how we see the world, how we perceive the world, and how we interact with each other. And more we're aware, and more I hope that we can enrich each other. So that's about it. If you have any questions, I can uh, talk also, uh, maybe if there were some things that weren't clear, uh, and if you need more information to understand what I was talking about, because I don't know what are your backgrounds, and if I kind of lack few information, don't hesitate, I can go back into the Malibu brain also. So I would say that. that's it. Do we have any questions? I no, no, no. Uh, I think the, the like creative therapy is great and amazing. Uh, I just don't have the skill. You know, I'm not skilled to do therapy, but for sure that I have an interest of how we relate humanly. And as a teacher also, I'm asking myself a lot of questions of how we transmit information. And with my dancer also, for me it's all like, Human, human work related, like when I say like my work is mainly doing human resources, <laughs> because if you don't, if you don't have access to the human part of the people you're working, like my tool is a body, and a body is a mind, and a body is emotion, and a body is like a unique dimension. So I need to access all of this, not only their physical. I need to able to get into all the layers. So this aspect is how I would relate to art therapy. It's kind of like touching all the layers of the human to get to whichever you want to navigate to. Do I answer your question? Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, it's actually it's very much I have asked that for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm an art educator, but the issue is um, when art Objective is not to be therapeutic, no, no, so I think it's where is the objective? Exactly. No, I, the objective I, is to create I, like a, art, like a, a product. We no, no, we have we have the the pressure to produce the product, and then it's how do you decide to produce your product? What kind of like route do you take to get there? Then I think the art therapy is really to get better. <laughs> or like to feel better or to, yeah. So. Sorry, can I move on to another question? Yeah. Um, I was just curious when you, when this piece was performed, like how much you put into either the description, like in the program, or if you said verbally what it was about, like how much did you um, give a scientific explanation for the piece and how much did you just let it speak for itself? Uh, I would say that I wish we had more than we did because uh, often when we write the program, uh, we don't know what kind of piece we're working on <laughs> because it's way too ahead. So uh, the program I had written was not super satisfying. We're still working on it because we still want to present it. And um, a lot of people said like, oh, I don't know if I see like, Circadian rhythm, or because we have a preconception of what it is, but all my colleagues, neuroscientists, for them was really clear. So it was super interesting to see that depending of your background and your knowledge, you don't see it the same way. And some people were like looking for it. Like people were looking for maybe like the end of the cycle, but there were no end of the cycle because there's one place I read that 
the circuit of the rhythm doesn't have any memory. So it finished it finished at 22.5 hours and then it's like start again. I don't know what happened yesterday. So I kind of use that in my work to not give any memory to so they could do the same movement, but they don't have any emotion relating to what they did before. Yes? I'm um, just wondering if you could talk about this work in relation to your other work, and like how, was there a change or, or how it's related to? Yeah, there were, like, yeah, there were a change because we, um, like I said, I never use any, uh, readings or any uh, theory to work on dramaturgy before. This was the first time I did that. And for me, I found it, uh, I just kind of hear it, does it work? Uh, kind of liberating because I could uh, have other hooks than what are normally having into arts. And, you know, we often read the same people, the same books, the same dramaturgy. So it was refreshing to go outside of that realm of just art, art, art. Yes. Carly, how how you do to navigate the jargon, the scientific jargon that you find in the works related with the science that you read? How you, you get, because sometimes they can be like, I guess, barriers. So how you move through those complexities? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> I, I, uh, I look, I use a dictionary, I use other readings, I go back and forward. Um, you know, I'm used to kind of like searching on my own. So I just keep digging and then if I don't understand something, sometimes I use terminology and sometimes it could take since six months before I figure out a word. And then I'm like, oh, this is what they were talking about. Okay, I get it. And just, you know, I just keep digging. Yeah. It's a question this class yes and if I find it really hard to make a translation of like a specific really complex scientific research into another vocabulary that is graphic or performance or whatever and to not get caught into the details of like that scientific research and not like block the creativity because you're thinking of like oh I need to add this really specific way that the neuron is functioning because it's there in the research so like how do you do your like you know i think yeah. you have to think that um don't think of being right yeah you have to see things see the information and just be like what am i what ins interests me in that like what does it triggers to me that information oh i kind of like the flow of it i kind of like the color or the and, and then oh I see you know like the research I did in my conversion class like she was targeting with blue light and yellow light to do her research and we got really into the colors so we started with that okay let's play with blue color and yellow color and see how does it affect so I think you need to take the element that really speaks to you and then start doing things with it. And then if you're out of the research, someone will tell you, oh no, you're out of the research. <laughs> Maybe you need to like be more specific with this notion. But then at least you're gonna be into your, you're gonna be owning what you're working with in terms of creation. So I try not to be too like technical about it. And maybe it's not good. Maybe it's, I don't know, but I feel like in that way, you can start having a conversation. Because you have to just believe that whichever input you have, like this science, you just get input, and then you speak back with it, with your knowledge, and your knowledge is art. So you just think about a conversation. So am I helping you? Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. Yeah. How long was the performance? 15 minutes. 5 0 or 15? 5 0. Yeah, like 50, 30. Yeah. So you saw two minutes of it. Yeah. Yes? Are you question? No. Did you get, did the audience give you a sense that they 
the non-scientists, for example, did, did they like the performance? And is that even relevant to your your definition of success? Or in other words, in other words, was the science mostly important just for you as the creator? And then probably it's kind of irrelevant in in terms of of the the audience. Yeah, I don't know what the audience is going through because I don't have the time to talk with every people. I can just say that we had a full house for the whole performances. Uh, that my proposition um, was very much appreciated, but at the same time, demanding humanly because it was people facing you. So there was no escape in the relationship between the audience and the performer. Like usually, like we do things and then we go away and then the audience can breathe. But in my proposition, we were maintaining contact and communication. So there was something uh, kind of like a little bit of like exigence. But I'm very happy about what we crafted. Yes, the main goal is to craft. But then having that, those traces behind, then we can open up the conversation. And then whenever we have to talk, like we often have to talk after the performances, or then people get very intrigued and interested to know about the science that influenced the work. And this is how we can start communicating, I feel. And just knowing that they have a circular rhythm, most of them didn't know that. So that is great. They're all on their trampoline. Yeah. And just to keep the same rhythm, mm -hmm. just that, we each have a different way to relate with gravity. So just to find a rhythm that is similar is really hard when you go on a non uh, a surface that it's moving. Mm -hmm. So just that, without looking at each other, you just have to sense if they were together. So by just opening up their antennas, this is what we do in dance. <laughs> we kind of like open up our perisphere or kinosphere, and then we're like, oh, okay, so you have information from this person and this person, and the other person have information from this person to this person, and then so on. So this we were working on that, but while they were doing that, they had a choreography to do. So let's say they had to do like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They had to touch their eyes, they had to like reach forward, bring all that together. But they were all doing it without looking at if everybody was at the right time at the same place. They had, and you know, the dancer wants to do good. They want to be perfect, they want to be with each other. So for them, it's asking them so much just to believe in what they're doing and whatever is happening, it's, you need to trust that you know the choreography, you know what you're doing and that we can all be together. So, am I answering your question? It's fascinating, yes. It's really fascinating what they worked really hard, <laughs> profoundly. <laughs> Not just only doing a choreography. Yeah. You can take one more question. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I was just wondering if you can expand a bit about like the title of the piece. Because I, like, I feel ground seems to be pretty obvious with the gravity thing, but I, I wonder if you have like some other scientific gravity. No. No, it's very, but ground, you know, ground yeah. is like where we stand and actually circuit, like the earth is having its own circuit and rhythm because of the relation to like the, the mammals, like all the, the animals also have a circuit and rhythm, like the cells. So, it was like ground, it's all related. And also one thing I didn't mention is like a lot of the studies, 
in the science are made on rat or uh, rotten. So uh, we have a series of gestures at the beginning that are very uh, class twitching, and we were very much inspired by that because I read so much about those <laughs> those science fixed research that I, I was always uh, very interested in this like fast motion kind of like. Um, uh, neurologic kind of like reaction and like triggering, but then reading all those science, uh, I was like, okay, we have this as like imagery for for the movement, like the squirrel, you know, like he's like ready to go all the time in the park. Like it's rare that you see a squirrel that's kind of like relaxed and looking for the CPS. It's always like <laughs> on this like a nervous system ready to go, so we use that. Before, just before to close, yeah. uh, the piece of heroin is really, really incredible. And if you guys have the opportunity to go and see it, please go, it's extremely intriguing, it's extremely visceral, it's, I just love it. Could you tell us when you will present it again? So if you have any idea, or if not, you have to tell us so we can put it in <laughs> convergence, so people can go and see it, yeah. so. Uh, not the full, just only excerpt. But if, if you do want, we're doing a special presentation on June 4th. So if you really want to come and see the piece, you could always leave your contact to Christian, maybe. Yep. And then I could put you on the guest list if you want, if you really want to see it. We need to use the papers for that. So just I know it's the next time we get it presented. So we could do that. Okay, with that. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.